Logic Pro has a ton of different features in it that can actually make your life so much easier, so much more efficient and faster. In this video, I'm gonna be sharing 10 of them with you that I know that have made my life a heck of a lot easier and I think you're gonna find them to make your life a lot easier as well. Let's do it. Tip number one is when you are working with actual audio samples, here's what a lot of people do. They'll go in here and be like, hey, that's a cool sample, and they will drag it and drop it directly into the timeline or the arrangement window, and then they'll be like, hey, I want it on beat two. Boom, it's on beat two, right? And then they play it, and then they're literally just working with audio, and then they're going in here and they're copying it and moving it wherever the heck they actually want it. And that, my friends, is not the best way of doing this. Instead, what you should do is this. Go ahead and grab the audio sample that you want, like this, grab it and drag it, and then actually put it right underneath the tracks in here. And it's now gonna ask you here, create new track using, it's gonna give you a few different options. In this particular case, I tend to prefer using Quick Sampler, but you could use Drum Machine, Alchemy, the sampler with a zone per note. I'm just gonna go ahead and use the Quick Sampler and set it to original. It will automatically create a MIDI region with that sample dropped in using the Quick Sampler within Logic. And now check this out. Boom, and we can actually start manipulating it inside of this itself, and I usually don't. But now I can go in here and record. Obviously, that's just an example. That's not actually a song I'm working on. <clears throat> and now we have the actual MIDI here. We can quantize it. We can start working with it as actual MIDI instead of having to work with it as an audio file. That right there alone has made my life so much easier. And I think it's gonna make your life easier too. That's tip number one. That brings us to tip number two. And this is something that I have found incredibly useful when I'm working either with myself as a vocalist or playing guitar, recording anything, or especially if I'm working with a vocalist in the studio here, and that is adjusting the metronome settings. So all you need to do is go up here to where your actual metronome is, hover over it, and when you have this little arrow right there, you're just gonna well, hold down your mouse, go to metronome settings. So now we actually have the metronome settings pulled up. Now, there are three different things that I'm gonna adjust within the metronome settings depending on what I'm needing help with. In a lot of cases, if I'm working on a really dense track, the metronome or the click can get buried within the track where the vocalist might not really be able to hear the metronome. So the very first thing that I'll do is adjust the tone of the metronome. So as we move the tone of this metronome, listen to what's happening. Let's open it up. So obviously as we move the tone to the right hand side, it's gonna really open up the sound and make it a lot more bright. The next thing we can do is adjust the actual volume of the metronome. And this is something that, again, I find incredibly helpful because when I have vocalists or other musicians in the studio, in a lot of cases, I have issues with them maybe rushing a little bit or maybe they're behind the beat because they're just not hearing the metronome as well as they should be able to hear the metronome. And these two things alone are very helpful. But that brings me to the third thing that I oftentimes will do within this, and that is actually adding the division. Listen to what happens when I add the division. It actually throws 16th notes into the mix. Now, we can adjust the velocity and we can also adjust the note, so check this out. Adjust the note. The velocity. So that's gonna essentially adjust the actual volume of the subdivision. And so again, one of the big reasons that I use the subdivision is just to help make sure that you can really get a sense for the actual timing of the track, especially if you're working in a track that is a slower tempo or there's not really anything percussive happening in the production, very ethereal type things where it's gonna be a lot easier to get off beat. That right there, my friends, is gonna make your life a whole lot easier with the metronome. Tip number three, how often has it been that you've been working on a production, maybe it's a big production, maybe you just don't have the best computer in the world and you start having issues where when you try recording vocals or recording anything with a guitar, microphone, DI, whatever the case it may be, you start having latency. The big thing that a lot of people are gonna do is they're gonna try to jump into here and open up their preferences. And the first thing that they're gonna do is you're gonna say, I'm gonna change the IO buffer size. And they're gonna try to make it so that the buffer size changes. However, the, what you should try first before going to this, and I'm not saying that's not a good solution, the very first thing that you should try, go up to record and make sure they have the low latency monitoring mode on. And what this is gonna do, if you have like a preset or something on top of this, and then we actually turn the monitoring on, look at what happens with these uh, plugins over here. Turn that on. It's automatically gonna take the plugins that are pretty heavily CPU dependent, it's gonna shut them off temporarily until we turn monitoring back off. So this makes it so that when we are actually recording, it's gonna basically monitor in such a way where you're not gonna have that latency or very low latency. And then once you turn it off, it will add those plugins back in. So this is incredibly helpful 
I've been using it more and more because I'm working on very dense productions where I do have to use it, even with a computer with 64 gig of RAM. And that brings us to tip number four, which I just learned recently. And this has everything to do with how you actually approach overlapping audio. Hear me out. This one kind of blew my mind. So you can go up to record and you can adjust how you want the overlapping audio recordings to handle, depending on if you have the cycle on or if you have the cycle off. So in this case right here, I have cycle on. And so if we go to record overlapping audio regions, automatically it's gonna just create another take folder, which is something I think we're very used to. So when you record something and you record over top of it, it's just gonna go ahead and create a nice take folder for you. However, what you can do instead is do create tracks and mute. Now watch what happens when we do this. So in most cases, it's gonna go ahead and create a take folder. But in this specific case, what it actually does is it makes it so that it puts it on new tracks. Now, the benefit of doing this is in many cases when I'm doing group vocals or gang vocals, which is basically where I want it to sound like a big crowd, a big audience of people singing, something like this where to be shouting, I want 15 different versions of this. Instead of having a take folder and then having to unpack all of those takes, we can actually create all these new tracks where the audio is already split out. And then all we have to do is go in here and then create however many new audio regions we want. So let's say we do 10 times and we just grab the audio and move the audio up to those new tracks and now we have it so that we do not have to unpack the audio tracks at all. Now the reason I had to do this is because for some reason it's going to treat these as if it's the same track. So notice when I'm moving the fader, it's actually moving these as if it's one. Same thing with panning, it's moving as if it's one. That's not something you want. So this is just kind of a workaround and now we have it so that we have these two audio pieces on two individual tracks. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Again, you can obviously imagine doing this 10, 15, 20 times, and now you boom, you've got your gang vocals. And that brings us to tip number five, and that is using Logic Remote when you are recording yourself. Now, Logic Remote is useful for a handful of different things. It's not just this, you can use it for a lot of different things. But one of the biggest reasons I love Logic Remote, by opening it up, by the way, you can just open up Logic Remote, it's totally free. By opening it, it will automatically connect into the Wi-Fi, and we now have this opened up in such a way that we can start controlling the actual DAW from here on my phone. Now, in a lot of cases, I will sometimes sing things where I'm just like sitting down, but if I'm doing something like lead vocals, if I'm actually the singer, I don't wanna be sitting down. I wanna be standing up. But here's the problem, is if we take this mic, we put it up here and then say we're gonna go ahead and do some recording. Well, if I wanna start recording and I'm not using Logic Remote, then I have to literally come over here, be like, okay, all right, gotta get this ready to go. Okay, now we're ready? Okay, cool. Gotta give myself enough time. Oh, oh, oh. Right? Which is super annoying, not very fun. Especially if you don't wanna be this close to the to the computer. Like say for example, the fan is, is going really loud and you don't wanna be capturing that fan noise with your microphone, then you might wanna go even further away across the room. So instead, you just use Logic Remote and we can stand over here and then we can start controlling the actual timeline on here. We could turn that cycle on, we can turn the cycle off, go. It's off now, we can turn it back on. We can control where we wanna be. And then from here, I can control everything from the fader to record. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Boom, there we go. So using Logic Remote is definitely one of the most valuable things that I've done. I've had this question so many times, how do I record myself without having to like walk all the way over and change it to where it's like a two bar count and so that I have enough time to run back over to the microphone and then record and sing and blah, blah, blah. And this is so much faster, so much easier. So if you have an Apple phone, an iPhone, make sure you get this, it's totally free to do. You're welcome. That brings us to tip number six, and that is that you can actually take audio and convert your audio into a MIDI region. Now, Nathan, how is this actually useful? Let me show you. Say, for example, you're not a wizard of a keyboard player. For me, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I'm a pianist, so this is not a problem for me. But let's say you have a really cool idea in your head, and you're singing a song. You're like da 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 da. So you've got this melody, right? But you can't play it out. So you're like, okay, now I'm gonna have to go create a MIDI region, and then I'm gonna have to go in here. I'm gonna have to now try to figure out, okay, what notes are these? Like that's so annoying. And then, duh. All right, so you know, this is what most people are gonna do, right? They're just gonna like draw it in. Um, again, I'm talking about this if you don't actually play the keyboard. It takes forever, super annoying, not fun because now I'm sitting here wasting time doing this. Here's what you can do instead. Just grab your trusty microphone and literally all we're gonna do is sing this idea in. Da 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 all right, not the best performance in the world, but you get the idea. You could do this on guitar too. So if you're a guitar player, you could just play that guitar riff in because you know you know how to play it in, but maybe you might not be able to get into MIDI. So now all we have to do is go in here, open it up in the editor window, turn on flex, 
turn on pitch. So once you actually have this uh, in Flex, you open up Flex Pitch, you're gonna go over to Edit, and you're going to Create MIDI Track from Flex Pitch Data. And look at this beautiful, beautiful thing we have here. And of course, we could go in here and quantize it. Now we can grab this audio, and we can now just place it on that track we had before. So the first thing is it's gonna be really quiet, so we're gonna have to increase the velocities on this so we can actually hear it. Here we go. All right, so obviously there are some little discrepancies and mistakes that you'll need to fix up and clean up. You know, you might not want that da, 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 da. But one way or the other, this is by far the fastest way to turn something into an idea in your head, singing it or, you know, playing it on an instrument, recording it in and then converting it into MIDI. And now we can actually start working with this. Boom. All right, that brings us to tip number seven, and that is actually using the MIDI arpeggiator that is built right inside of Logic. Now, I know many of you are gonna say, okay, yeah, I get it. But I'm actually gonna show you a couple little crazy tricks that I have found that I think, you know, just little extra added value for watching the video, if you will. So if we go to this keyboard instrument right here, it's like this muted plucky thing. Right, very short. What we can do here is go to the MIDI effect, we can grab the arpeggiator, and just by opening the arpeggiator, obviously it's gonna do what an arpeggiator does. And this is built directly into Logic. And this is something that I love about Logic is that you have this directly built into it. And you can get extremely creative about how you use this. You can do the live mode, which is where you can literally just play out ideas. You can change the rate from slow to fast, eighth note, basically just based on the actual rhythm itself. You can do octave range, you can do variations. Which that's cool. But then you can also go into the grid mode, you can uh, turn on chord pattern, and you can adjust the actual velocities of these, which is really kind of cool. So say we want to do a chord pattern. You can also adjust the actual rhythmic value of this, not the rhythmic value, but how long it hangs onto these notes by just dragging in here. So if you wanna have like short, so long, short, short, and then like maybe long here, like this. Which is pretty cool. And here's one of the really cool things that I really love doing with arpeggiators that I think is gonna blow your mind. We can actually take this and do a crazy fast rhythm. Let's do like this. I mean, that just sounds ridiculous, right? But watch this. Set this to like a crazy fast rhythm, and then you can actually start creating melodies with this. So check this out. Let's just hypothetically say we want some crazy lead kind of sound. I mean, that, that's pretty ridiculous, right? Now, I'm just gonna show you one thing I could do with this because you might be hearing this and thinking, that's kind of ridiculous, but you do this in combination with a few extra little fun things, like for example, using some sidechain compression, or in my case, just using the LFO tool. Check this out. Now we get this crazy kind of sound. We could use something like spaced out to add some reverb, and now it's gonna start sounding a little less crazy, a little less weird, a little more awesome. Check this out. I mean, come on, you throw in some drums, some bass, some crazy stuff. As just a way of reminder, this is what we started out with. What we ended up with. And again, that's, that's literally using something that's built directly into Logic. Obviously the LFO tool and Spaced Out or not, but you could use other plugins that are Logic plugins for that. But by getting creative with how you're actually using your arpeggiator that is directly built right inside of Logic. I think the MIDI arpeggiator is one of those things that like a lot of people don't know about, but it's actually very useful to doing things very quickly. That brings us to tip number eight, and that is a feature called Chase MIDI. Now I wanna show you this right here. If we have MIDI notes like this that are very elongated, say you're using strings, or in this case, something that sounds like this. Right, very ethereal, it's long notes, long patches. And if you have a lot of instruments like this stacked up, the problem is, is that what if I wanna start on bar five in the middle of the note, if I play this, it's gonna wait until the next MIDI notes actually play in order for it to then basically play. So what we're gonna do instead is make it so that when we play in the middle, it's basically gonna catch the MIDI notes or chase the MIDI notes to then play them right away, even though that's not actually when those MIDI notes start. So the way that you actually set this up is by going up here, file, go to project settings, go to MIDI, and then go to MIDI over here and make sure you have chase selected and select notes. By simply doing that, now when we play this, no matter where we click and play, 
and it's going to automatically chase those MIDI notes and play them. By the way, if you think these sounds are awesome, this is from the Hammers and Wave Library. I'm a huge, huge fan. Incredible. You should totally check them out. All right, that brings us to number nine. So this is actually a tool that you can use within Logic. So when we go to our tools up here, you can notice that you have this automation curve tool. So let's go ahead and take this sound that we had before. It's pretty ethereal, cool sound. But what if we wanted this sound to be more dynamic? Now you can do this with strings as well. This is actually one of the best ways of automating and making strings more dynamic. So we're gonna go ahead and make this actually a lot bigger. So what I want this to start doing is I want this to start swelling. So I'm gonna just go in here and use volume automation to do this. And so I want this to swell for each chord change. And so what we're gonna do is put a pin on each time the chord actually changes. And then we're gonna put a pin halfway through. So it kind of swells up, swells down. So we're basically putting a little drop here and then we're gonna go ahead and pull this down. We'll just say that much, why not? Pull this down, pull this down. So if I were to just go ahead and play this, this isn't gonna sound bad, but listen. Okay, this doesn't sound bad, right? But here's what we can do. With the automation curve tool, we're just gonna go and grab this. We can now actually set it up so that it's going to actually add a natural curve to this, which is going to be a lot more musical. Check this out. Now we could go in here, maybe we don't want this curve to be quite as aggressive. Oh, don't go crazy on me. Maybe we don't want this curve to be quite as aggressive on the slope down. So we can obviously adjust this curve so it's not as crazy. We can actually adjust it upwards as well, which is another really great way of doing it. I think I'm gonna go ahead and try that. Here, let's check this out. So you can do this obviously with volume automation, but if you're using strings, you're using the modulation and expression control, do the exact same thing with your strings. This is gonna make things feel so much more natural. And don't do it with just these types of long expressive things. You can try this out in a handful of different ways. It's gonna sound a lot more musical and creative than simply having a straight line. That's the next one. And that brings us to number 10. And that is actually setting it up. So that way when you play anything in with MIDI, it will automatically quantize for you. Because this is one of those things that is not not difficult to do, but over the longevity of recording things with MIDI, the more you do it, the more you're gonna realize I'm pretty much always quantizing things. So let's go ahead and go back to this kind of art thing that we have here. All right, so what we're gonna do here is click on the track that you want and then make sure you pull the drop down window on region and the inspector window and you have this quantize button here, or drop down menu, and it's typically gonna be set to off. But instead you can set this to automatically quantize to whatever value it is that you want. So for me, I'm typically gonna go ahead and quantize to 16th notes because I'm typically not doing things beyond 16th notes. Obviously, if you are, you can make however the adjustments are that you need to make. And now we can go ahead and record and it will automatically quantize these notes for me. All right, so I'm done. Open up the editor window and voila, just like that, it's already quantized, which saves a nice little step in the process. And again, this might not seem like a very significant thing, but over the long term of actually doing this, this is gonna save you a huge amount of time. If you think these Logic Pro tips are helpful, I have a whole other set of videos on Logic that you can check out right here, and I'll see you there.